Thanks That's how that. we, we we move through Harvey, not you, Harvey. It's a terrible name for a hurricane. Well, someone, <laughs> so, so, someone, hurricane Harvey's bad. Someone <laughs> asked me. I didn't put it on the question list. It says, "Can we give her the nickname Hurricane?" And I was like, "No." no. Uh, <laughs> this is Pod Have Mercy. Russell, this is Pod Have Mercy. Uh, we just finished jurisdictional conferences, and for people who are not like deep in the weeds of United Methodism, that won't mean anything except a big fancy word. All I'll tell you is this where they elect bishops and assign bishops to a regional area. Correct. And we're in the South Central right. jurisdiction of the United States. You have been the bishop for the last, supposed to be eight years, but 10 years because of COVID in Louisiana. I have. And now it's, we found out you're going to be our bishop in the Texas conference Yay. beginning January 1st. January 1st. And 66 days. Yes. And you're coming home. <laughs> I am coming <laughs> home. <laughs> so I thought we'd just start. People get to know you, like hear from you, like your story, where are you from? You're called a ministry. Did you get to be a bishop and coming back here? Uh-huh. It's coming home for you. Yeah, mm. it is coming home. Um, I was raised, born and raised in Big Spring, Texas. Do you know where that is? It's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there is always how I describe it. Far West Texas. West Texas. Right. Far West Texas. Closer to New Mexico than I think it mm-hmm. is to the rest of Texas. So I grew up there. I grew up in El Barrio, surrounded by family. Um, I grew up Roman Catholic, and my family was very Catholic. I always say I was a really good Catholic, so I'm a really good United Methodist because of that. <laughs> uh, very disciplined, went to church every day, um, that sort of thing. And um, probably as I was... Um, and toward the, my senior year of high school, I started just asking a bunch of questions. And in the in the Catholic Church, you don't bring questions, right? This is it. It is what it is. So um, I went to the University of Texas. And Hook them. Yes. Uh, a lot of people will like that around okay, here. Yeah, I went to the University. Of, both of us went to the University of Texas, right. so we're all good. Mm-hmm. Uh, my daughter went to Baylor, so we're, we got a little a bit of, of like something else. Too. So. Um, I got involved in some campus ministry. I was that annoying person that knocked on your door and said, you know, do you believe in Jesus? Nice. Uh, yeah, that was me. <laughs> and uh, I might have knocked on your, on your door if you lived in Jester dorm, you know, that kind of thing. But um, again, I uh, got involved in a local Baptist student union there on the campus and asked a lot of questions and it wasn't appropriate for me to ask a lot of questions. Mm-hmm. I ask a lot of questions. Ask anybody in my family, ask anybody on my staff. I ask a lot of questions. And um, so I met my husband uh, my last year at the University of Texas, and um, he'd grown up Missouri Synod Lutheran. Oh, wow. I'd grown Ooh. up Roman Catholic, was attending a Baptist church, and we said, you know what, uh, none of this works for the two of us. Mm-hmm. And like a lot of people, we met in the middle. Uh, and I think that's really important for people to know. Um, we met in the middle and went to the United Methodist Church. Yeah, because the Missouri Synod Lutherans, they don't play well with they others. They don't play no well with others the... at all. Yeah. And um, so it, to come to a place where we could ask questions and it was okay, mm-hmm. and it was okay to not have it all figured out, do not have all our stuff together. Uh, we were young, we were exploring, and it to me that's, that's really... That, that is what it means to be a United Methodist. It's a place where you've got some some safety. It's a safe place for you to come mm. and ask questions. It's not perfect. Mm. It's not perfect. But that wide middle uh, that I've always experienced and that accepted me as a female, as a female of color, uh, that had a billion questions uh, with not a lot of answers and a lot of opinions, uh, I was received in the United Methodist Church. And actually, the first church, you'll appreciate this, the first church we joined was Dunwoody United Methodist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, Dunwoody. And uh, so (laughs) we were both working uh, at the time for a shopping center developer, and uh, we went to church at Dunwoody United Methodist Church. That was our first church. We got married in a church in Big Spring, Texas, First Methodist Church uh, in Big Spring that unfortunately is now uh, a disaffiliating church in Northwest Texas. Mm-hmm. So, um, but, you know, I, I just think about that broad center and I really believe that's, that's we came with questions. We came questioning our own our own our own thoughts our own identity you know who are we we're now in this um multiracial relationship uh how are we going to get accepted in the world and uh, we were accepted in the united methodist church 
That's and funny. so, I, you know, we came back to Houston. I, it's funny that we are, we left Texas, come back to Texas uh, a couple of times. Mm. So we came back actually to Austin, uh, worked there for a while, and then we came to Houston over 30 years ago. Mm. And somewhere in between all of that, uh, when we came to Houston in 1984, we joined Foundry United Methodist Church on Jones Road. Yeah. A new church plant, newish church plant, and became involved there by necessity. Um, <laughs> the church had gone through a, a split founding pastor had left, taken two-thirds of the congregation with him, sound familiar? And the remnant was left there, and we had to do everything in the church because there weren't the resources. Uh, There were people, uh, about 200 people left, and it was out of that experience of getting so involved in a local congregation. And to this day, I think both of us would say it's the most foundational, exciting ministry we've ever done. you know, we cut the grass, clean the toilets, uh, set up chairs on Sunday, uh, and it is, it's the most exciting ministry mm-hmm. I think I've ever done. So um, Godfrey Hubert took me to lunch one day and said, hey, you know, have you ever thought about going into full-time ministry? And uh, I said, well, you always talk about the ministry of the laity. I thought I already <laughs> was. Uh, it was just my smart aleck response. He saw you cleaning the yeah, toilets. Yeah, he saw me cleaning the like, toilets. Oh, yeah, that's her. Ministry. She can set up chairs. Um, yeah. And so it was 1992, and I received this um, amazing gift of a church that received me, and I went back to school and did the whole nine yards. I was part of the first uh, Perkins South campus here uh-huh. in, Houston. Uh, in Houston. And, you know, it's just been an amazing uh, series of events that have always seemed to align. Mm. I didn't wake up every day saying I wanted to be a bishop. This was not, I mean, some people do that. I realize that this, this person did not. And I had a group of uh, clergy women that encouraged mm. me uh, in 2011, worked on that for about a year, and was elected in 2012. Um, I was at UMCOR at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know That's you, right. You, yeah. you, were, you were here on staff at, the, at a church and then on the conference office. Right. right? So I went from Foundry to Memorial Drive, where I served for Which is about, right down the right road down the from here. Yep. 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 Uh, you were our competitor uh, <laughs> in, the, in the real world, right? Not the church world. And I uh, served there for almost 12 years. And then Bishop Huey asked me to come to the cabinet, and yeah. I was a director of missional excellence. Um, <laughs> after the Haiti earthquake, I don't know if people remember this, but we lost two of our leaders at the Hotel Montana in Haiti. And I went for a three-month temporary assignment to New York to UMCOR that ended up being almost three years. Wow. So I was elected uh, out of UMCOR. So, I mean, it just... And UMCOR, for the people who don't know, is United Methodist Committee on Relief. Correct. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it was funny. When I was assigned to Louisiana, we crossed the Mississippi River Bridge following the disaster response truck because it hurricane isaac had just come through louisiana wow. Wow. so you know if a complaint had been on my desk on day one i wouldn't have known what to do with it um but i knew but you knew what to do with i knew what to do with a hurricane yeah. so it was you know which louisiana is like one of the best places to uh, go. You, if you're going to learn if you want to learn Houston how to do or hurricanes louisiana, yeah, there you <laughs> that's where or you maybe go. florida yeah yeah so it's just been you know nothing that looked like this you know mm-hmm. kind of like nothing in my rear view mirror looks like what's in front of me all along the way but s- all of these things just seem to align and so to come back to the texas conference um is pretty exciting it's changed a lot i've mm-hmm. been gone almost 12 years now mm-hmm. um, yeah so that's one of the questions that came up you you've been gone 12 years right so, but you were here for a long time yeah what there's a lot of things that have changed. Absolutely. Maybe some things that are the same. You probably have a lot of folks you were friends with. I'm only here nine years, and so I wasn't here when you were here before. Right, right. I don't have a long history here. Matt's been here longer than I have. But mm-hmm. yeah. how, how does that work? You come back as a bishop. I mean, you've got people that you came along in ministry with and you're friends with. And how's it coming back to um, to refresh your things with the things you know and learn the new things you don't? Right. And, yeah. and what are the relationships to look like? I mean, yeah, I mean, that's going to be, I think that's going to be uh, an interesting transition um, because I left and I was Cynthia and I come back and I'm Bishop. And so boundaries are going to probably be a little. I call Bishop Harvey, by the way. <laughs> well, Matt and I have gone, we go back wait, wait. a lot further than that. So um, I still call her Bishop Harvey. Though. <laughs> he does. He does. But we've done a lot of other things together yeah. since then. Yeah. So um, 
you know, I think there's going to be some boundary setting, but it is, you know, I know my way around. I know the culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, It is a very different conference than when I left. Uh, Lots has changed. Uh, And it's not just been in the last, you know, two years. It's, you know, this 12 years. Mm -hmm. A lot has changed in the world. So um, I think that, you know, we were trying to get on 59 the other day. And that whole exchange is completely different than, like, I missed it. Right. uh, Because it's completely different. (laughs) So a lot, you know, not just... You know, roads, but a lot has changed uh, culturally and theologically. Well, really great in Houston, every way. like we're going to shut this down. We're going to work on this road, so we want you to take this road. And then, now we're going to work on this road, which is the one we detoured you on. So now we're working on both of them. Now at the same time. Yeah. And at yeah. that point, we're not even going to get you a detour right. anymore. Just find your you way. Just find your way. But is you know that's a, a great metaphor the, <laughs> right. of where, where we, we are, are now. <laughs> find your own detour. Yeah, find your own way. Well, I think that's going to be interesting. Like, um, I mean, you you've known her for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I mean, I think from Mercy Street days. Yeah. It's when I met you and uh, just watching what you were doing it. At Memorial Drive, and we met each other through conference things, and I've just, yeah, it's just been really wonderful. Yeah. And then working with you as bishop when you were in Louisiana, um, just, I'm, I'm really excited about um, yeah. about this and yeah. about your coming coming home. Right, it's exciting not to have to start from scratch. Yeah. <laughs> Developing, you know, I will have to develop relationships, some sure. renewed relationships, some new relationships. Mm-hmm. I, I was working on some of the planning for the jurisdictional conference. There were people working on. Um, the conference that had no idea that I had ever served here. So mm. I know there's that. Yes. And then uh, how do I manage the boundaries that I'm going to need to set too? I don't want to take advantage of anyone in my relationships, nor do I want to be taken advantage of because of our mm-hmm. relationships. So we're just going to, you know, we're probably going to stumble through this a couple times. And, and that's and not uncommon. I mean, you, okay. when you're over people, you, you want to be friends. But you have to be a boss. Right. That's a hard thing you learn yeah. too. Is you have more staff. Yeah. And when you're used to being friends and you yeah. like being friends, right. There's always going to come a moment where it's like I'm not going to be a boss. So it's right. better to sort of right establish that early on. And that that sounds horrible when you say it. Kind of like well, everybody we're redefining relationships, <laughs> Jeff. You answered me, son. <laughs> you... No more happy hours with you. <laughs> no more happy hours. But I mean, I think it's, you can have a great relationship with people, but also say, look, there's going to be some lines. Right. I don't think and there's anything. I think that. people will honor that. Yeah, yeah. of course. Which, which kind of gets at like effectiveness of vision and leadership. And so like, as you're moving forward, what are some of the things that you're, you see are on the table for vision and leadership for this, this era, this, this season? Well, I, I don't think ch- church is going to look like anything mm-hmm. most of us have known in our past um even not, and it doesn't just have to do with disaffiliating churches it has yeah. to do with long history of decline yeah. so this isn't anything new but you know I, I think about you know i love the whole fresh expressions movement for example mm-hmm. of how to be the church in different ways and in different places and, and you know i always say we own a lot of real estate uh, across the yeah. uh, across the state of texas and i know i'm sitting on a big piece of real estate here here, but we own a lot of real estate, and in some places we're not using the That's spaces right. that we've got. So how, what do, how do we get creative with the space? What do we do with the spaces that we do have? And how do we embrace um, the communities that, that we're not reaching? I mean, over time, I mean, we've just lost a lot of people. So how do we reconnect and reclaim that? Mm-hmm. And how do we experiment? You know, I'm, I'm up for experiments, and, and that means that we're going to fail at some things. Yeah. And we're going to have to be okay, uh, failing at a few things, trying some new things, and figuring out what is it that we need to be, and where are the people, what are the needs, and mm-hmm. that's what I hope to do in the first you know few months. And I know that you know my runway's very short. Yeah. You know, I'll get here, we got to make appointments, we've got an mm-hmm. annual conference five months later, da yeah. da 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 da. You know, and it's like, oh my gosh, how am I going to? But I want to listen to where the people are because mm-hmm. I think that there's just right now I, I feel this in, almost like a pause. And I don't think that's just a Texas conference. I think that's that's across in yeah. our entire connection. So how do you how do you meet people's needs right now? Mm-hmm. Uh, what are they feeling? How are they feeling? Our clergy are worn out. Yeah. 
and we've got to listen. I'm, I'm just, I'm very concerned. Mm-hmm. I'm very concerned about clergy right now, mm-hmm. and um, and I'm, I just think it's time for us to reclaim who we said we were in the first mm-hmm. place. Yeah. And you know what a great opportunity to try some new things, um, do some pop up stuff. You know, pop up church. Um, mm-hmm. Let's not go invest you know zillions of dollars on buildings and land. Let's figure out where we need to be and who we need to be in those spaces. That's great. And new ways of, I mean, Matt's really good at this I stuff. Know, I know he I is. I mean, creative. That's why I'm sitting here looking at him as I'm talking. <laughs> yeah, not looking at me. <laughs> just, no, but I mean, that's that's why, you know, we wanted brought him back at Chapelwood because, I mean, what he does, you know, whatever you call it, a water walker, a dream weaver, um, there's some people that have the capacity yeah. to see things that other people can't see. And that's what you want. And new ways of funding ministry. You yeah. know, we're looking at grants, ministry, and all these sorts of things. Right. And getting out in the community. Mm-hmm. You know, people used to, I mean, if Jesus were here, he's out what in the houses of sinners and tax collectors. If yeah. you right. use the, the the biblical model, you can have church in a in a uh, you know what's the Lazy Oaks? Oh yeah, in a pub in a in a pub. pub in a pub. Uh, yeah. You know, I, and I think the modern the, the culture now is probably way more okay with that than they would have been. Oh, a generation ago. Absolutely, we're we're actually you know RVing <laughs> is a big deal in Louisiana because okay. of tailgating okay so i'm thinking yes yeah, so you know these zillion dollar beautiful giant rvs mm. what if we just p- put them in parking lots uh yeah. around the, the conference and s- just see who would show up yeah. you know what would we do there um and i and I, I to me that's just I, i'm my number one strength finder is futuristic i'm a mm. futurist so i'm always coming to you from the future uh and so i'm always i'm i'm all, i'm down there thinking yeah. you know what's yeah. going to happen next year and the year after that That's so good. you know I'm, I'm pretty excited about the possibilities and i see that more as an opportunity not it's not a problem no. um we can get stuck there really easily mm. so yeah, I, you know, there's been so much negativity. I, so for people who don't know, our conference our conferences elect delegates to go be representatives at these jurisdictional conferences. Mm-hmm. And so you elect on bishops and then you meet. And in our, um, um, in our meeting, I remember we went around the room. One of the things we talked about is we have some people in our delegation who are in churches that have voted to disaffiliate. And so you had to have some honest conversations about hey you know you're here you're leaving you've already voted to leave it was it was real honest um i felt there was a a holy moment there somewhere Mm. um that people felt like this was a good thing that was happening so we can agree to disagree on certain things but their spirit was not toxic in the room Mm -hmm. and what was what was fascinating to to me was we we interviewed no we didn't interview you are already a bishop we interviewed the new people that were Mm -hmm. running for bishop a lot um Mm -hmm. so we elect and i remember at the end there were two particularly that we talked to and interviewed that were new running for bishop and i remember one lady who is in a church that's disaffiliating it's already voted and she just got weepy like emotional Mm -hmm. and she said when i hear the hope when i hear the future when i see these candidates and hear their love for Jesus and how they're weaving their faith stories and weaving the scriptures. I mean, I I don't want to put words in her mouth, but she almost literally said, it almost makes me think maybe we, we, we could have stayed together or there was this, Oh no, I'm telling you, I'm not lying to you. You can ask anybody that was in the room and there, there was just this, it it was emotional. Yeah. And I'm just like, man, you know, like I kind of think we could do it with unity, even though we're, we, we have different ways of looking at it. But I just say that because people think, because it was a resolution about, Hey, if you're, if you're leaving, why don't you just have integrity and go, go already. There's the door. But I'm like the dynamic nuance. This is the thing about life with other people Mm -hmm. in churches is it's way deeper and a lot more levels. And there's a lot of variations. That's right. Some people are very traditional on human sexuality, but very socially progressive on social issues. Right. Right. Or vice versa, and I, you know, I just I thought that was interesting because it led me to think about how uh, we're moving forward into the future, and that there is going to be nuance in relationship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought when we were talking to you, so they announce it on a particular day. It's really kind of a, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. They do it like this everywhere, but it, it feels like bid day. It, it it's it is like for <laughs> so sorority fraternity it's thing. Bid day. It's so. Can so I say des- cheesy? So it's describe describe it for cheesy. folks that don't know. All right, so 
You have representatives, like every delegation has two people, and they're on this Episcopacy Committee, Committee on Episcopacy, and they go in the, it's not this, I say smoke filter, it's not like that. They really do collaborative work, and they look for what's best for the jurisdiction, right? But they do all their secret work, you don't know what's going on, and you all don't even know what's going on. I mean, like, Bishop Harvey doesn't know where she's going. She knows she's not staying in Louisiana. She doesn't know where she's going. And there's all these rumors like, oh, well, we think you're going here or you may think yeah, you're going there. Right. Yeah, and that's, yeah. that's, the, that's where you get in that's trouble. Dangerous. That's dangerous. where you start that's to yeah, tickle. That's your, dangerous. Mismanage expectations. <laughs> and so we had two conferences that are going to share a bishop. So there's all these things that are going to be different. And what they do is they start walking out. So that you're two representatives. Who starts walking out? So from the back room, okay. there's, there's like just think three people. Okay. The two are your delegates okay. that are on the committee of episcopacy and then the bishop and their spouse so they start coming out like an order here comes arkansas here it comes pageants. there she is, there is. And, and it is and what happens is so you don't know all you know is like the first group comes out from arkansas and you see the, the delegates and you see laura merrill who was uh -huh. elected as a bishop no one else and you hear arkansas Ooh, it's like Ooh, like it really yeah, is yeah. like sorority and then they start coming out and then everybody then this other group cheers and the other group cheers and the other group cheers and the other group cheers, and the other group oh we didn't see that coming because yeah. it's all right oh, there so in coming out time. with the delegates of where you will be well, going yeah and let me backtrack to how we get to that oh yeah because there's <laughs> stuff that goes on behind the scenes okay. that i'm not aware so of. um that's crazy you, they bring the bishops in to a room all right in oklahoma city when i was elected actually we were lined up in a hallway and you're you're in the room. A cattle shoot. And we stood. <laughs> that's, what, at, that's, what, that's what Bishop Huey said. It felt like cattle. It was, you know? okay. Like you're, you're yeah. being shown as cattle. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And so Dean and I, all of us are standing around the room. So Dean and I are like, we don't know. I mean, it's taken a long time. So you know that when it takes a long time, what you thought might happen is probably not going to happen, exactly. right? Yeah. So we're like, I'm probably, you know, his hand is bleeding because I'm holding <laughs> it so tight. And so in comes Arkansas, and they walk over to Laura Merrill. I think, okay, so I'm not going to Arkansas. Check that and, one off. <laughs> and so, it, so they just walk over to you. There is like I, I would love to tell you that it's just like the the sky opens. Holy yeah, yeah. And, and it's just like and, what's up? Yeah. You want to dance? And so <laughs> Tom, hey girl, Pace, hey girl. and Don, and House, Don come House come up to us and said, you know, are you ready to come home? Wow. And I'm like, oh my god, I never thought this could happen. I really never thought this could happen, and uh, that's it. And you were just gobsmacked then. You uh, were just. Uh, what do you say? And then they say, "Okay, now we're going to walk out there." <laughs> we want you to say in front so, of everybody. In front of everybody, <laughs> and you're just wow. trying to get yourself together. And and I was worried about Louisiana. I will just mm. say that I, I not worried, but uh, concerned. I wanted yeah. them to have a, a great leader. And so I, I did watch the two people walk over to um, D. Williamson, Williamson, and I was so excited. Okay. That's a first. Okay. You know, I was the first, yeah, lots of history yeah, here. Yeah, I was yeah. the first woman, woman. of color. Uh, I was the first person of color, first woman of color. And now we have the first African-American woman going to Louisiana. So I got, I mean, I got teary-eyed awesome. right there. Yeah. And then. It is emotional. It's a little emotional. Yeah. So then they walk you out and they kind of And they just you walk you out. Everybody. So they tell you and walk you out. Mm -hmm. You're processing in real time. And so then wow, everyone in the room, all the, well, there's the 200 close to 200 delegates but then you've got everyone who's shown up right that we can drive and they're sitting in outside <laughs> the bar or whatever in the balcony because and a lot of folks from our conference showed up they don't say like right. who's our bishop going right. to be i walked out and i looked over you guys were cutting up on the front row which is normal and I, I should not sit on the front there's row. a there's a yeah, shocker i should yeah, not yeah, sit on the front row i mean they're texting me during the session because i'm like y'all need i can't even look at you uh, they were cutting up i don't even know what they were talking about and, i can tell you what it was later and, about they, i don't want i don't think you don't want, you don't want to know. Know. um and i looked at I looked at Jeff McDonald, mm -hmm. and I mean, his eyes got as big as saucers, saucers. like I'm not yeah, believing yeah. it. Now, none of us, because going back to your home conference is not. I think that's important, the shock, that because that's the yeah. same, it's the same in southeastern jurisdiction. You just, you rarely go back to the conference you came out of. Well, that, right. that, that almost never happens. You never can go, like, right away. Your first. and the, Bob Farr did so, for us, but there are, very, there are, very, it's, rare. it's very rare. And just because there's just too many lines, yeah. you know, relationships. Yeah. But even then, coming back later, that 
doesn't usually happen. So I think no one was really expecting it. I don't no. think you were expecting no. it. So I think that was the moment. It's like it comes out and was like, wait a minute, is she standing in front of Tom and Don? Maybe she's standing in front of, you know, because you're trying to process, and then you're like, oh, okay, this yeah. is good. And let me tell you why I thought it was good as just purely selfish motivations, because I'm sitting next to these guys, and they're like, well, you know, we might we might get a bishop who's brand new. I was like. No. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And they were like looking at me and a couple other folks. Well, it means you're going to have to really kind of walk alongside and help them out, maybe hold some, hold some their hand and help them. I was like, I'm not doing that. I'm <laughs> done with that. <laughs> Working my butt off for the last. I said, I want somebody to come here and knows what they're doing. And they my first thing, I was like, wait, Harvey. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Harvey knows what to do. She, she, she doesn't bitch. need anybody to hurry. She can I bitch. Like, I mean, that's, I was like, good job. That's why I was going, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. And I and I think it also it just cools some things down. You know, coming home, it's like okay, you, we know who you are. We've watched you. You know, there's a sense in which we've helped raise you in right. a sense. You know, and it's like okay, this is family. Let's put it back yeah. together. Well, and I think too, um, the last ten years, and particularly the last, I would say, two to three, four years as the president mm. of the council. I mean, my, I've been out there in public yeah and a lot of places so there there is no question for some people as to who i am <laughs> now there's some misinterpretation as to who i am yes. and um so you know people look at you know things through a tiny pinhole and paint the whole room that color or whatever yeah. and uh so i think what's important for me is to be clear about who i am what i believe and what are my non-negotiables? What are things that are important to me? Mm. And and that would be true whether I'm serving in Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, or wherever. Yeah. It wouldn't. It would not. It, that would not change. And mm. yet, understanding the cultural context, yeah. how you apply all of those things, is obviously different in Arkansas and all those other places. Yeah. But I think that in some place, in some cases, I was probably mischaracterized or misinterpreted. Um, by some, and I want to mm -hmm. make sure that Let's that's cleared up. Let's talk about this, because I think this is a big thing, and that's why, while a lot of people, like I'm excited that you're coming, there are some people who have not really been excited about the United Methodist Church, right. may not be excited about you coming. Right. And let's talk about why, uh, because I think this is gonna be helpful as we're, you know, we do this pop-up, and I want to send, I want people who are in churches that are maybe still questioning, or wherever they are, waiting for being a bishop, um, and I'm just going to be real honest, because it's usually the way I roll, is that uh, you've had a target on your back, front, side, uh, head. head, everything, right? And I'm going to tell people why they don't understand. Um, you can't be angry at nothing. You have to project it onto something. It has to have some substance. Mm -hmm. And the folks who have been uh, leaving or pushing or advocating getting out, you know, the big issue is human sexuality. And then they wanted to make it about doctrine and theology we could talk about that in a minute and then it's about organization bureaucracy bloated bishops or horrible the bishops are horrible the bishops don't follow the rules the bishops make up their own rules the bishops break the rules the bishops are blah 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 and you just happen to be for a while not recently the president of the council of bishops so if you're mad at the bishops where does that land? It lands yeah. at whoever's at yeah. the top, mm -hmm. yeah. and you happen to be at the yeah. top. Yeah. Not only that, but you, I remember here at a pre-conference meeting, there was a pastor in our conference who was giving a speech about a particular uh, uh, thing that, uh, all this stuff about disaffiliation, and said, well, let me just give you an example. You know, we could have someone like Bishop Harvey, who doesn't just charge you the minimum, but she charges you an extra 20% of the value of your property. I think it was 40 40 percent mm -hmm. i think it was 20 40 oh, it doesn't matter but they said an extra percent so i did something that i thought was probably novel and maybe not done anymore i picked up the phone i think i called you or i said hey so let me ask you a question they're saying that you charge and what did you say to me that's not true okay <laughs> so i reached out to this other guy and said hey this is not true you might want to correct it because I'm not going to correct it because other bishops are doing it too. Gosh. And it's just whatever. Yeah. So even though integrity. they said something about you that was false. Right. And I told them that I talked to you as false. I said, why don't you pick up the phone and call her and find out the details. Uh -huh. So I think it's important for people to do the work. What we do in this whole thing, and I think it's led a lot of churches to disaffiliate 
uh, without really doing their own due diligence. Right. It's discernment. They start. I, there's one guy mm-hmm. told me in a church. He said we did discernment, but we started on the one yard line. Right. It wasn't fair. No. And and that it, and it was some decisions have been based on fear. Mm-hmm. Fear of what you know yeah. and, and fear, uh, misinformation or distorted information, distorted facts. So you know maybe take one factual piece of information but take it out of context Mm -hmm. and blow it up like you know bishop harvey's charging 25 to 40 percent of the value of your property not true and by the way i can't do that that's a trustee (laughs) decision even even if i wanted to i can't do that so there's just been a lot of that and and i have been the target and and i you wouldn't believe some of the things people have said um, about me to me. And, and I, it's interesting because sometimes I'll read something somebody said. And I'm like, God, I didn't Who know that, that I did that. <laughs> Who, is, Who that? is that person they're talking about? I didn't do that. So, you know, I, I, I do think that that I have been mischaracterized as being, you know, some radical left wing something or other. And um, I am not that. Mm-mm. I am not that, you know, talk a lot about the big tent, about having room at the table for everybody. And my God, if our table's not big enough, let's make it bigger, get rid of the table and just make us, you know, add more chairs. Yeah. Uh, and, and that has to do with who I am. Mm-hmm. I mean, how I was raised mm. is there was always room. And, mm. and I'll just give you this little story. My mother's love language was food. Mm. And so when you came to our house, it didn't matter. It didn't matter when you came, what hour didn't matter. You came and there was a place for you at the table. Mm-hmm. People came to our Thanksgiving dinner. I did not know who they were. Hmm. So my home was built on, and I'm telling you, my mother's dining room table was no bigger than this table. And there was always room at her table. I will never if we, if we ever become a denomination that becomes so uh, exclusive or inclusive that we become exclusive, we're, I, I don't want to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. So when I say big tent, when I say there is room at the table, when I say I believe that everybody has a voice, everybody mm-hmm. deserves to be loved and heard, uh, I, I, I really mean it. And if I if I said anything or did anything otherwise, I'll t- my mother would come back and haunt me. And that would not be good. That would not be good. So I, I, I like just, when you say it, uh, that's not in- exclusive, but also not so inclusive that it becomes inclusive. Yeah. And we talked about this in our meeting with you because there's several of us who are traditionalists and compatibilists. As Bishop Muller says, he likes the word unity, mm-hmm. traditional unity mm-hmm. candidates or whatever. And um, I think... Originally, what's happening is the church is trying to create a narrative to say, hey, we want to be more inclusive of people who have been excluded, particularly LGBTQ people, all right? And so we're, 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 we're figuring that out. But in the meantime, having that conversation and working toward that, now you have people who are traditionalists who are saying, well, now I no longer have a seat. Right. Now I no longer have a voice. Now I'm being pushed out, which is what a lot of folks have said. And I guess uh, I still think that there is going to be There are going to be millions and millions of traditionalists who are going to still be in the United Methodist Church and moderates. How do you speak a word to them? I know it's hard coming at this, but this is where the battle lines are right now. Sure. Because I don't want to be dismissive of of folks who have been excluded for so many generations. Um, But now folks are being forced with this false dilemma that if you're a traditionalist and you believe in traditional interpretation of human sexuality in the scripture, you can't be United Methodist. Right. There's no room for me. Yeah. I mean, if you really think about who we are as United Methodists, we've always been that broad center. Yeah. Um, we've always, I mean, Wesley, you know, got sideways with the Anglicans for it. So, I mean, it's like mm. how, you know, this is our DNA. It's who we say we are, that we're inextricably connected. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> we, we cannot um, say to the other, you don't belong here for whatever yeah. reason. You know, toe can't say to the foot, you know, I don't need you. Uh, so... I just think that that has been who we are. That's part of our DNA. That's part of our history. It's who we say we have been. Mm-hmm. And so now to go here to say, well, there's no room. And I, I don't want to be in a church that all believes the same thing or has to check all these boxes in order for you to be a United Methodist. 
remember back to that's why I came here because of that. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have to be able to to agree with everybody on everything and that my opinion might matter. Um, So I I think that there we are we will be a better church because those traditionalists stay. Um, Mm. We can't go all right, all left. That just has never served anybody well uh, throughout history. Wesley was was not was not either or. Wesley was yes and, and so to to give people this sort of binary choice, um, I just don't think that's who we are. And you know, I, I hear these churches that are going independent. Well, that's an oxymoron to be an independent Methodist. Wesleyan. Yeah, there's a an church. Independent there's a, Wesleyan? I think there's a church named John Wesley that's going independent. Well, I'm, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> no, I know. I'm just saying I can. <laughs> you can, uh, but I'm not going and to. And I, you know, I mean, it's a, there, there's a lot of churches named lot, John Wesley yeah, that are going, going independent. Uh, yeah, there's a crazy. lot of churches that have, are choosing that route. And, you know, my favorite part of the Book of Discipline is not the, all the rules in the back half. Um, my favorite part is in the front part of the, uh, yeah, the theological too. test. Yeah, do- your doctrine, yeah. your effort, your your. Th- that's Social the other principles. thing too. You know, when the human sexuality thing, what people don't realize is that conservatives in America, even people who are Republican or lean Republican in their voting, you look at the accept acceptance or at least allowance, mm-hmm. right, for uh, LGBTQ inclusion. It's it's much higher. I mean, we're talking about now getting to the 60s, 70s percentile. Sure. And so what happened was you go in the room and say, we have to leave for these issues. And most people, even conservative folks are like, like me, are like, I don't leave over this. Right. So then we had to make it about theology. Right. Or, so now you're not orthodox. I'm not orthodox. Right. I'm not evangelical. I don't have a high view of scripture. I don't really believe don't in believe the Bible. In Jesus. Yeah. And yeah, I don't believe in the divinity of Jesus. I don't believe in the virgin birth. I, oh, and, and even though you, you say they're there in the book of discipline, and it can't be changed. Their big thing now is like, well, you know, what good is it if you have seat belts if you never put it on? Yeah. Or, yeah. Well, the, you know, the, the other target recently is we're going to change the articles of religion. Well, it says clearly these articles will not be changed. Mm-hmm. I mean, why? But we're not really going to believe them. We're anymore. not going to believe them. They're going to be in there, but, but you're see, not really look at them. this. Look what they've done here. <clears throat> but what I say to people, if you don't believe them, this is what uni- this is what Methodism is. This is what United Methodism is. Right. You're always going to have outliers. You got outliers in the Catholic Church. Right. My brother is a Southern Baptist preacher. They're now arguing about women in ministry. Right. You know, they're, they're, every church goes through this thing where they're struggling, and then you always have someone who's the outlier. You know, they find some quote from some person who says something that's kind of crazy well that was the thing that when we met when i met with the delegation is that i can assure you that i know all the bishops yeah yeah you do i know them all um spent two years now i spent really you know 10 but two years working very very closely with these bishops the things that they say that all the bishops do Mm -hmm. is not i mean it's like Maybe one might have said one time, you know, I really struggle with, you know, this whole virgin birth thing. And now it's like, well, they don't believe in the virgin birth. Mm. Or, you know, so it's like they've taken one thing and said, now it applies to all. And I, I just, I, I, I'd i like to have a conversation with those people uh, to say, I have been in all of those rooms. I mean, I've been in every COB meeting. I've been in I was part of the mediation team on the protocol. Mm -hmm. I've been, you know, so I've been in a lot of these spaces, and what you say is happening is not not what happened. Now, there may be one truth of that, but you take it, and now you you Mm. apply it all the way across. It just doesn't. It's not mm. Well, that. if you were going into a court of law to prove a case against 12.8 million Methodists and you had 20 or even 40 or 50 examples or quotes, they'd, you had no standing before the court. They'd laugh you out of the court. Right. I mean, and that's mm. what has happened. Right. I, I've <clears throat> been in the church my whole life, been 30 years, been plus 30 years, been in churches, working churches, traveling around. I'd, I've never seen this. Yeah. I've never seen a church that says... They don't really have to believe in Jesus. Yeah. You don't have to really believe in the Christ. I've never seen it. No. no. I, I mean, I, I, wherever I, I go, north, no. south, east, west, I've no. never seen no, it. Not no. at all. Not at all. Um, so as you come, one of the things one of the things I'd like to know is like as as folks get to know you that may not know you, what's what's one or two things that you hope and that you would want folks in the Texas Hano Conference to know about you as a leader? Okay. Um, I'm approachable because I think that's something people don't 
always believe that bishops are approachable. Mm. And so I'm interested in what you think. I'm interested in your opinion. Mm. Uh, I'm interested in that. Um, the thing is that I'm, I'm going to lead faithfully. I am going to, and I hate the word fair, because fair is what to whom, you know? Yeah. But I'm going to be fair. That, that might mean that you think, okay, so I'm a liberal and I think she might, you know, have favor me, or I'm a traditionalist and she might fit. I don't, I don't do that. I mean, if you want, go back and watch me preside in the 2019 General Conference. I hope I prove that I believe that everybody has a right to bring their stuff to the table, yeah. and um, so I'm, I'm going to lead that way. And I, I honestly, I mean, I was consecrated to guard the faith and the unity of the church. Come on. And man, I, I'm not not gonna do that. I mean, I don't. That's that is not even up for grabs uh, for me. Not, not it is my non-negotiable. I am to guard the faith and the unity of the church. That's why it pains me so much when uh, I will tell you at our annual conference in June we disaffiliated ten churches. Friend, I couldn't get through the liturgy. This is in Louisiana. In Louisiana. And that's just 10. 10. Uh, so my, my team is like, you're going to make it through the, the next round? <laughs> and, I mean, they've created ways for me, I mean, to, to be able to to get through it. I mean, I was – I had to stop. Undone. I was mm. undone because that is not – the church that I want to be a part of. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to put so many wedge wedges in this that somebody says, I'm a traditionalist and I don't I don't feel like I belong here. Mm. Man, I, that that's not that's not who I am. Yeah. And so when I hear that and I've heard it more than, you know, a, a hundred times already, and there's no room for me, I wanna what does that mean? What would room look like for you? Um, and you know, no, we're not every. You're not going to get a gay pastor in a church that's traditional. You know, that's that would be foolish. That's an assumption that you, the people say. That's a great question for you just to answer straight up. If a if a church says, "Hey, we're traditional. We don't want a gay pastor." If we don't have a gay pastor that I know well, of. Well, and right now, but if we did, you we can't. can't. You can't. But if you did someday in the future, uh -huh. that's what they say. The fear of the future, uh -huh. subjective, <laughs> is that they'll appoint a gay pastor to my church even if I don't want one, as a bishop. Was, was that something that you would do? Never. I mean, that would be self-destructive. Why would I yeah. want to harm your church, which harms the conference, uh, which I, that would be a, a foolish decision uh, to do that. Um, and or that everybody's if, if it changes right now, we're, we're not there. But if, if okay. it were to ever change and everybody's going to have to do gay marriages or I will be, you know, penalized. No. If you if you've got strong convictions and you say, I will never do a gay marriage, um, but I can stay in a church that somebody else might be able to do that, I'm okay. That to me would be the kingdom <laughs> on earth. Um, so That's the unity, and I think for tr for yeah. folks who are more conservative, is they have a hard, it, it's been hard, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I've lost, I've lost a lot of friends in this. And they think, well, if I'm in that church and they allow it somewhere else and I stay in that church, somehow I condone or accept that. And I try to make the case that, you know, when you read the, Jesus at the, the dinner, at the table with sinners and tax collectors, it doesn't mean that he's condoning their actions, right? right? But he is condoning the worth of the people and right. he is condoning the importance of being at the table with them. Um, yeah. hmm. and, and we can't be able, we, it's hard for us to separate that. It is. It because is. unity is really not a high value for well, us. That's well, because, not uniformity. And unity because, is yeah, not yeah. uniformity. Yeah. That's right. And it, because it's not an idea either, it's a set of relationships. Right. And this is where I think that we've moved away and, and using words that we, unity is always has a story to it. Yeah. It's always relationality. Right. And so I think that in the relationships, they can bear a lot of flexibility if I know your name. Right. If it's not. And that's what John, you know, when you help help us understand that. So there's so much fear about the future. Right. That's disconnected from relationship. Right. But in those kinds of relationships, we work through those things. We talk about those things. We understand that the spirit is up to different things in different places. Right. right. And we honor that. Well, and that's, I think that's also part of the pain for me hmm. is the relational piece. 
Yeah. Uh, I was talking with a pastor about these heart issues, and I said, you know, this would have been a lot easier 10 years ago when I didn't know you as well, and I didn't care for you as, you know, I didn't know you to care for, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, and it's like now I've got these deep relationships with people, and I don't, I, I don't want us to continue to harm one yeah. another, yeah. and um, so I, and I don't know that people believe that, y'all. I mean, I say that, and I say it, and I say it again. I think I've said it in one form or another from day one in Louisiana to now. I, and there's still people who don't believe me. Yeah, yeah you're just saying, it's like, why, why, first of all, why would I not tell you the truth? And what is, and, and then I start, it's like, what is it that I'm saying that you, that I'm not communicating here or that, that you can't believe? Um, but hmm. that's really the, a very, um, for me, that, that's really painful. Um, so yeah. um, when I hear of these churches, um, the church I got married in in Northwest Texas, yeah. disaffiliated, <clears throat> you know, wow, um, that, those that hurts trust me my the one I, the church i moved here from is sp splitting i mean they're just it's, it's just painful well and mm -hmm. it divides the even you know the churches we talked about this the other morning the churches that for one reason it didn't it didn't pass one way or the other right yeah. so I mean, you already had a divided church. The minute you start having this conversation, right. people start picking sides. You activate them. Yeah, yep. it's like, okay, let's go. You, you know, it's Where are you? them and us. Yes. Uh, I even heard a church refer to the pers the other that we're talking about as their as the opposition. I'm like, whoa, that's whoa. a that's a horrible word. Mm -hmm. But you know, these churches where you're divided, you know, right down the middle. Mm -hmm. um, you, it, I those that's going to take some incredibly um, strong pastoral care Absolutely. and pastoral So that's work. a good, you're Absolutely. such a great segue um, in this thing because the next thing is brought up at our meeting too. We have a lot of churches that are experiencing a lot of grief in the midst of this grief. Uh, we've had churches that voted to disaffiliate and they got 60% for and it failed. Yeah. And we've had churches that had 66.9% and passed. Right, so you got 30% of the people that, so a lot of pain. I have started just because I was in the discernment groups and going to the district meetings and all these things and we were leading this stuff. Um, I've started getting a lot of emails and letters and just pain. I mean, people who are, you know, they, there's a lady that joined our church here. She called herself a refugee. You yeah. know, they, they call themselves wandering in the wilderness and um, you know, we have diversity here in our church. We have some people that would like to vote and mm -hmm. like, you know, like to go through discernment. Um, but right now we're able to live in this tension through the relationships. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You know, we talk it out on Sunday mornings. Some uh, members of our study team uh, leadership were going to a different Sunday school class and they were having conversations in the hallway. Now, yeah. he was doing more listening than talking because he wasn't really allowed to say anything, but that's okay, they're, they're being heard, right? right? right. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the pain of this is what's happened, we've talked about this a lot, is we've gone from values of good and evil, right and wrong, to now the highest values in our society are winning and losing. Right. Yeah. And as soon as you move into a discernment, especially when you already have a lot of people that have predetermined the outcome, mm. then you activate everyone and you everybody's pushed to a camp. Right. Right, so you've created division, which is the devil, That's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion. Yeah. How do you see uh, yourself as a leader helping through this grief and this loss that we're, that you're going to be coming in right in the middle of a lot of this stuff. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. It's, um, and th this is, if anything, you know, a lot of things wake me up at three o'clock in the morning, but this is, this is one of how do you mend relationships? How do you, how do you serve a church? You know, I, I actually had a woman in a church that had, um, left one of those churches in Louisiana that voted to leave in uh, out of the 10 at annual conference went to another church that's now in this process again mm. she wrote me this letter I, I i cried i mean i i just read her letter at my desk and i thought wow and i had to say to her we'll help you find a home we will help you find a home mm. so uh, there's that and then how do you the pastors leading in that you know not everybody can do that i mean that's yeah. just that's just tough slugging one of the things i thought i was thinking about the other day and i was talking to someone you know uh, is this like uh, crisis um response 
stuff like you know when there's a unfortunate shooting in a school and they bring in all the the crisis counselors you know do we need to do some of that kind of work yeah. that, that, intervention that, yeah. Yeah. that intervention deep work because uh, some of these folks are really i mean they're devastated absolutely and i have a, a young pastor in louisiana right now that's leading a church that that is and she's staying but the church is working toward disaffiliation uh, she's a young pastor, wise beyond her years, mm. uh, the way she's handling this. But you know, I, I worry about her. Absolutely. Uh, and then I worry about this woman that's joined now two churches. And she's like, yeah, I'm not going to join another church. What questions do I need to ask before I go to the next church mm, yeah. so I don't find myself there? So I think part of our work is going to have to be some really strong, um, deep, pastoral intervention i don't know what that looks like uh we've never been here so i mean with the there's been enough wedge issues throughout our united methodist history some i'm not very proud of you know if you talk civil rights racism yep. you know uh central jurisdictions we've, we've just been through a lot of those um and i'm not sure we ever handled some of those well mm-hmm. i'm not sure we ever handled them at all in some cases so i don't want this to be another one of those things I don't want this to be another thing that we didn't, and it's it's because it's it's not it's hard work. I don't want to avoid it. Um, so how do we listen deeply mm. and um, try to navigate this in a way that mitigates harm? <laughs> so <clears throat> one of the things we're having to do and at least look at and begin to to work on is you're going to have United Methodist voids or deserts or whatever you want to call them from areas where mm-hmm. y- you know the region enough to know the 290 corridor it's, Cyprus it's desert. is now a desert but we have United Methodist a former pastor of yours who's like taking it upon himself and others to pull people together and say right. hey we're gonna have a space for people right and they're in a beautiful venue right up there in uh, in Cyprus Sci Fair Church Start and um, mm-hmm. so what are your what are your thoughts on planting new churches and communities where we've lost churches uh, you know, the vision for that, the the people are involved, just however you're thinking about that. Yeah, and I think this is also going to have to be very creative. Uh, it also happened, I think, in Tyler, as I've been watching, is the, the remnant from Marvin uh, went and actually met at one of the churches that I think had been closed mm. and started meeting there. So, I mean, I think that people are, are hungry and are willing to do that. Uh, I think we've got to look at, again, back to the, the pop-up church, creative ways mm-hmm. to do this you know, and I think church planting, I, I've actually been asking this question for a couple of years. Mm. Uh, what does church planting look like for us? I don't think it's go buy a piece of property, build a building, get the church chartered. And yeah. I, I don't I don't think that's the model anymore. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I don't think it's that. Um, I wonder how you scale. So if you maybe we need to, to rather than planting another, you know, church with 10,000 people what if we planted you know 100 churches with 100 people and um it's rather and how do you multiply that and scale it uh in different places i also think we've got to use our resources that we have Mm -hmm. you know how do you take the most creative people that we've got um and sometimes those are not always the people that kind of fit the fit the model uh and some of those people kind of get out of bounds at times but i think that we're gonna have to look at some really incredibly creative ways where are those venues um and you know is it the pub Mm -hmm. is it um the park is it the swim club at fawn villas uh you know where is it uh, in the houston metro area and beyond i mean east texas is a desert yeah. Um, there are hardly any churches up there. So what does a new church look like? And I think rather than, like I said, l- let's not spend a billion dollars buying property and building buildings. Let's figure out what the people need. What would they? What do they want to be a part of? Where do they want to go? Um, and what kind of church are they looking for? Um, that's why I really love Fresh Expressions, uh, is mm-hmm. that it's just a new way of being church. Um, and I, I think it's just going to have to be creative. And you know, I'm already thinking about how we put a group of people together that just dream about what that looks like. Uh, how do you and where where do they need to be strategically yeah. and who is it that can help us think this what about like the people that that's 
<laughs> that decide where a school goes in a new community. You know, not just a bunch of preachers, right, in a group, but where, where are those kind of strategic people that decide, so where are we going to put the next H-E-B? Chick-fil-A. You know, or Chick-fil-A, or, you know, and, and why? Or, you know, this is, happens a lot in Houston, or it did, where you would see like a school out in the middle of nowhere, or a grocery store, mm-hmm. and it's like, uh, this looks like something's coming. And my background is, I work for a shopping center developer. Mm-hmm. This is the exact work that we did. Uh, we looked at where where the population the bases were, yeah. what are the trends, what are people looking for? And you wouldn't build like a traditional mall in you know one place because that's not what the people really wanted. You know, you, so you you kind of created the spaces to address the communities. Matt's done some of this. I'm, just, um, I'm excited about yeah, that. Yeah, Matt's too. With, I'm thinking with Matt uh, Fuquay. Yeah. And like uh, we have tons of people in this city who are United Methodists who have some mad skills yeah. uh, uh-huh. to Incredible. be able to be creative about housing and and like building housing and creating space at the bottom that we can do ministry in. Yeah. You know, it, it, I don't know if I'm giving it right terminology. No, no, that's right. Some that yeah, and so, some of that is just kind of following Kleinberg and, and exegeting him as yeah. if he is a biblical scholar. So he's still around? Well, yeah, his his work is. I mean, okay. he continues that on uh, through Rice and, and the Kinder Institute. And I think that looking at some of those trends and looking at what are the needs of Houston, part of this, part of my excitement about you coming and moving beyond, <laughs> not moving beyond, but but not allowing this to occupy our sole imagination after this this season is beginning to really think about the new frontier and the mission of God. Yeah. And I think there's folks that are have been doing this work that, have, as you've said, have not had a voice. I think of Saganta Joseph, who is working uh, in, in, in some of the wards uh, and some of the ways that she's been nurturing community among. I think really having folks that have been in the trenches doing these things for years and asking them, yeah, tell us what you're learning. Right. And and how do we not um, maybe scale that, but how do we learn from you and come back to our own context and do those things? Right, That's right. how we, we move through Harvey, not you, Harvey. It's a terrible name for a hurricane. Well, someone, <laughs> so, so, hurricane someone, Harvey's back. Someone right. asked me, I didn't put it on the question list. It says, can we give her the nickname Hurricane? And I was like, eh, no. I don't, know don't. But, no. don't want to be distracted. No. A hurricane no. of peace. Be, yes. But, but, but I think about all the things that came out of Hurricane Harvey. What we did was yeah. when we went and got a lot of money, grant money, raised money, then we went, who has a relationship That's to right. the community? Right. So we went down and Project Curate and, and mm-hmm. these folks had relationships in certain areas of town we didn't have, but that was where they got hardest hit. Right. So we said, well, let's come in and work with you. We'll provide And those folks funding. didn't have any resources. They had resources. And that's that the connectional connection. sy- system, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. Is they, being able to work with John and Chapel. And they had work. trust. Oh. The yeah. other thing is you go that's into right. a community that's different than yours. Right. Like we're heavily involved in Spring Branch. We're slowly building trust, but still, I mean, you're talking about a very different yeah. type yeah. of community. They're not sure about us all the time. Well, and I wonder if they're, and I, I don't know this, and I do know some people in some of these foundations like Lily and some, mm-hmm. and it seems to me that this could be an avenue also if we're looking for some financial resources yes. to look to these places that are building communities. And maybe it's not your typical ch- churchy kind of groups, but what about I don't know. I'm making this up. Procter and Gamble, or or some, you know, you watch some of those commercials, like you know, mm-hmm. you, and you think, oh, I want to be a part of that, and then it, you don't. Then it's it's somebody that makes you know soap. Yeah. Um, but it ha- and but that's that's the kind of work they do is to to really address communities the needs. in need yeah. and the, the the needs of the community. So I I, yeah. I I think that that's some of the creative work, yeah. and and I don't. I mean, our our, our pastors are are tapped. Uh, and I, I really uh, would love to figure out how to create like an advisory council. I mean, this is a huge city, you know, the, the and, and the Houston metro area and beyond. Six point six million. Mm-hmm. So w- every resource wow, we years ago. we need, I think, is here. I just don't know who all those players are. And so, how do you get those big players to the table that really care about communities? And I'm not just talking Houston. I mean, we we've got to look, you know, beyond. Houston, sure. but um, this yeah. is obviously. I mean, with the desert and 290 and uh, other places. I mean, I just I think that. But to, th- some to po- think about that is exciting to me yeah. because I think that that one 
as United Methodists, we have in our gut this kind of innovation, right? That the spirit is up to something, yeah. right? And that, um, and that in our city, if fine, if if Kleinberg is right, that the future of America is going to be worked out in Houston, then I think then the future of the American church is going to be worked out in Houston. Mm-hmm. This is an amazing place to be right now, yeah. yeah, right? And I think we can we can create innovative labs. We can really spawn ideas. This can become a hub of what the church could be possible across across the globe or at least across America. I think you get the right players together, innovative, and pull them all across our conference, whether it's from, you know, College Station in Bryan or East Texas or Lufkin or Tyler or wherever else. And you begin to share, you know, Houston's a different a different culture right. than once you move out of town. That's fine. But Galveston, look at the, some of the things that are going yeah, on Michael. down there. Right. What you Michael's know, doing really down there. Really creative Central. stuff happening yeah. all over. But you got to like think outside the box. And that's why, you know, we've talked about this hybrid. You know, we're going to have pastors that may not have places to land. Yeah. You know, and maybe we have some financial resources that we can find or come together. And let's appoint them or park them work with a church like Chapelwood and say our job is not to get you a job for the rest of your life our job is to prepare you to be cutting edge ministry right. yes. and put together a team and sort and then launch you out right. wherever that is to go wherever you need to go yeah i, I mean i think the that, new 21st century circuit riders right uh, and where are those places for the folks that you know where there where are the chapelwoods where are those churches that can really raise up those kind of leaders for us for the future. Um, and I, I, I mean, I'm, I don't know what the conference resources look like right now. Um, I, I will do. soon. Um, but um, I, uh, I, I have, I have some hunches <laughs> and I have some information, but I don't, I've not seen yeah. it with my own eyes. I've just heard it with my ears. Yeah. So I want to confirm that. But how do we deploy the resources that we do have? Because they're going to be limited. They're not yeah. going to be what we had before. And so what are the best ways for us to deploy the resources that we have for the greatest outcome that we need in order to meet the needs of the people? Um, so how does Chapelwood then you know, birth another community somewhere uh, by raising up a leader within your congregation mm-hmm. yeah, that mm-hmm. says, you're right, John, yeah. I mean, they don't come here to be here for the next 20 years, but how, no, do, you, how we, do you prepare we were talking, them and send them We off? were talking in our executive team. It's like, okay, look, if you're looking, let, let's find out where some folks are. I, I call it parking, but developing. Soft landing What here. is it? How are we yeah. developing to retrain them? Yeah. Job, you know, it's like job training. Like, how do we retrain you to go do this new work somewhere right. else? Because someone, I, I've heard more pastors that I said that I, that have been kind of in between limbo and want to stay United Methodist. And I say, hey, would you want to go plant a church in whatever city? Oh, no, I don't plant. I can't plant or whatever. And I'm like, that's the kind of mentality. Because my first thought is, you give me a pub? Yeah. I'm in. I'll plant. <laughs> me and Jeff. Hey. You ready? I got my worship band. <laughs> I, got, I got my DJ. I got, we got, we're all, we're, we're good too to many go. spirits for you guys. Yeah, so let's, yeah. let's, let's just go after one spirit right now, guys. Spirit. <laughs> what do you think about Hispanic congregations? I, what's <laughs> the biggest surprise for me when I came from Georgia, I thought Houston it's over 50% now Hispanic mm. of the city. I know we're talking a lot about Houston and there's a bigger conference, but I think across our conference, uh, you've got a lot of diversity Texas. here as well, but mm. we don't seem to do well with Hispanic. Ministry. Yeah, I think, and then I don't think that's just Texas. I mean, I think that that's just something that we're, we're learning still how to do. And because Hispanic ministry is so, so diverse within itself. Mm-hmm. So you've got your Mexican immigrants, right. you've got your Hondurans, you've yeah. got and um, mm-hmm. when I came here, by the way, uh, went to the, te- uh, the conference staff uh, and on the cabinet, Hispanic ministry was in my portfolio. And so I remember uh, meeting and, and getting, you know, kind of in the folks getting in arguments. Well, you don't know what it's like to be, you know, from Honduras. No, I, I really don't. You know, I, I'm right. not. But, you know, so there are that diversity even within the community, I think, mm. is is part of the challenge. Yeah. Um, so I, I do wonder whether there is an opportunity. I mean, with with the population, what it is, I think the assumption is that every you know, all Hispanics are Catholic or all Hispanics are conservative. I, that's not always the case. So how do we find out where are the people? Um, they may not ever come to Chapelwood uh, or to, mm-hmm. you know, wherever. They're, they're, we're going to have to go to where they are. 
I'm convinced of that. And because I realize that in a Hispanic culture, regardless of what kind, um, your community, your home, once I come to your house, we're friends forever. Hmm. So, uh, and once you come to my house, we're like, friends for a lifetime I'm like mm. more than forever mm. so there is something about coming into your yeah. your place yeah. that's really important so i think that's we've got so to good. think about where where is the where is the the equivalent of the pub in mm. the pockets of where uh, hispanic latinos are living um and so how do we go where they are rather than expecting them to show up yeah. somewhere i can't wait for Amen. you to come and see spring spirit uh you know baseball and then our mm-hmm. campus on campbell road yeah. we basically we're doing is it some, the old is it the old um it's the old, is, is it, wasn't that an old church is it that was the, one? the branch we had okay. out there a long okay. time ago okay. but yeah but i mean we so what we did is we said okay here is a ministry started by a guy from chapelwood and donated the land was donated by chapelwood and the guy's like he's getting it done yeah. he's reaching hundreds yeah. and hundreds of kids and families around baseball that was hidden coming out and so then we had this other campus and we tried hispanic church and just didn't work and it didn't work we said we had soccer fields yeah said so, so we thought well we'll do it we're like no kenny can you do it and he's like yeah well yeah. let's try it yeah and so it's i think the new way of of saying you have to like have your hand in everything or you have to run it is you really have to find the right partners right. who share the values you do yeah, yeah. and then you join together yeah uh, and i think we, that we got to do more of that yeah i mean so friday night worship kids come you know our uh joseph rios who's the over happiest place Generaciones on a friday night. congregation over in spring branch goes and it's yeah. just mentoring families and it's so beautiful. there's stuff happening but you can't think that old traditional let's start a church in a building like you said it's it's going to have to be really different yeah well and i've um i haven't used a lot of my spanish for the last 10 years uh, in louisiana uh yes, and so um, i'm gonna have to it's gotten a little sloppier <laughs> so i'm it was it actually been great to be at jurisdictional conference you know just being in houston yeah, yeah. where everywhere i go if there's a spanish speaker i, I feel sorry for them because just I'm, go just, to El Tiempo. I, I'm just going to start speaking Spanish. That's I'll what I do. Uh-huh. My, yeah, my, uh, Kimmy at El Tiempo, I said, I only want you to speak to me. So, solo en español. Uh-huh. And he does, and I don't understand half what he says. But, uh, you know, there you go. I'm hey, I got toilet paper for a guy at the hotel, you know, who was trying to ask <laughs> one of the, the service workers for toilet paper, and he couldn't figure out how to say it with his, you know, eighth grade Spanish. See, so, you helped. Hey, I, 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 you All right, I only have one or two more, and then we got to go. But, um, it, and, and how would you handle, and I don't know when or if this happens, uh, how would you handle a church or a pastor that's disaffiliated and at some point within the next year, two years, three years, whatever, decides they'd like to come back? If mm. a pastor leaves the United Methodist Church, the way back in is to the DCOM. Which is a district committee yeah, of ministry. ministry. Mm-hmm. And they, the DCOM decides whether they're, they can and they have to begin process so it's again. not like they come to you and say please let me. give me my orders back yeah. or whatever yeah. and it doesn't happen that way um they and so it's the board of ministry that that manages that process to cre- recredential them i guess mm-hmm. the right word um uh, in order to come back and so um i that that's not like an automatic and i know i've had this conversation with pastors it's not like okay i want to come back um it, i don't make that decision yeah um that because remember the the board of ministers the executive session of the clergy vote when you leave and they can vote you back they, in. they vote you back in and the only way you can do that is to go through the board of ordained ministry yeah. but um I, the the question behind that question i think is that there's folks that get out there and they think oh this is a wilderness i i i want to come back home and maybe this is home that's a possibility yeah and um, I mean, going through the, the, the things that they have to go through, that's a possibility. And we would welcome folks that want to become United Methodist again back into. There is um, a process. Okay. Absolutely. What about okay. churches? Yeah, churches are a little tougher of a, a deal because that has to, you know, goes through. I would imagine it would be like a new church start, a new church plant going back to the church of board, um, the uh, district board of church location and coming back in that way so it'd be like if any independent church came and said we want to be united methodist there's some process that i'm I'm sure they go through 
But but I, I guess the thing that I would want to say, and, and to just put an exclamation point mm. on what you were saying, is there is a way back. Yeah. There okay. is a way back. And not not through a, a bunch of folks beating reeds at them. And, it's you know, not punitive. The walk it's, of shame. It's just the process. Is the pro- <laughs> this is not yeah, like, you no, know. No, no, you don't have to do that. <laughs> you know, yeah, the, Game of Thrones. <laughs> Game of Thrones. Uh, the Game of Thrones, right? No, but but it, it, you know, like Good Methodist, there's a process for yeah. that. And, um, and that's why when I meet with pastors who want to withdraw, because you don't disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church if you're a clergy person. Yeah. You withdraw. And that language is really important mm-hmm. um, and, and what that means. And so um, it, it's, it's, I want to make sure that they know you can withdraw, but you got to think about things like your pension and your health insurance, and you've got two little ones at home. You know, let's talk about this. Mm-hmm. Um, so this isn't a decision that ought to be taken lightly and so we i've had many one-on-one conversations with pastors they get a letter from me in the process um so i I know it probably feels um like we have a lot of steps to go through but we do and how they withdraw what they say what who the letter goes to and um and then there's a way that's what i've always loved about i was on the board of ordinary ministry for like 12, 13 years before I came to mm. Texas. And what I always appreciated, because I remember, I'm not going to say who it was, because I love him dearly. He was our bishop. And he was really mad before leading into general conference. He wanted our board of ordinary ministry to submit legislation to like do away with the due process so they could just not appoint pastors because, you know, the guaranteed appointment sort of thing. And it's hard. I would, you know, this. It's hard when you have ineffective pastors or pastors who just aren't any good, and they're elders, and you have to appoint them. And you know, and so I got it. But what I said was, we have a process. We have due process. And he said, John, it's hard. It takes a long time. And I said, Yeah, that's right. It should. But you got to have <laughs> the backbone to say we're going to go through this process. And this, that's what due process is. When you move out of our system, you lose that. You don't have any due process. Right, right. Your church can say. You know what? Now that we're independent, Matt, don't want you yeah, as a pastor like you. anymore. Cut your you hair know, or whatever. And and there's no there's no process. You can't call the district superintendent. You know you can't like it's not relationship. We, you, like like you can't. They don't have midnight called SPRC meetings without the pastor. Right. You know, their book of discipline doesn't yeah. allow that. Like a shotgun board meeting of the book. You know board of deacons at the Baptist church, and you come in the next day and your office is cleaned out. <laughs> and I, and I'm not saying that, but that happens. Right. You Absolutely. Know? When you look at the tenures of pastors, they say, well, the average tenure of United Methodist is like 3.4 years or something like that. I mean, look at the Baptist, like 1.5. Right. Um, so. I don't know. I think the um, to me the due process is the, when they talk about bureaucracy and institutionalism. There are things in there that protect people because sometimes people need to be protected. Right. I right. say sometimes. I mean a lot yeah. of times. Right. Uh, people need to be protected. Yeah, and I mean I think what I always tell churches and clergy uh, is that the process seems unwieldy, and it's complicated. It's complex. But it's the best process out there. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the yeah. due process protects the church. It protects the pastor. It protects the congregation. Um, so I, I don't. It is, it is hard. I wish it was faster and all of that. But um, I think our process. Um, you're you're right about protection, but it also it not just protects the clergy; it protects all the. I remember years all. ago we had the first time ever in the history of South Georgia we actually went through a process and we removed someone due to ineffectiveness. That's a hard one. It is a hard one. And, and and you know what? It took a long time, a lot of meetings. I was on the executive uh, committee of the board of ministry. You know, there's, it it was tough, but man, it was not easy. And it took a while, which it should. Cause you know what? You could come in tomorrow and say, John, he's not very, he's not very effective anymore. And so I'd like to get rid of him. Right. I would at least, at least like my day in Some court. Some process. Because I'm like, I know I'm not effective at everything, but I think a couple of yeah, things maybe. I might get by. <laughs> you know, so yeah, that was the whole thing because there was this fear. It's like, oh, well, you're just going to kick everybody out if they have a bad appointment. No, this guy had been, you know, in seven appointments in, right. you know, 12 years. Right. Yeah. Right. And had a trail of bodies right. uh, behind. And collateral. And damage. Mm-hmm. And so... 
And then it gets to the clergy session where everybody in that room right. votes and agrees except for a few friends. Right. And you realize you've done your work. Right. You've checked all the boxes. You've made the case. Right. And it gets to the ultimate body. And they're like, you know, that's right. Yeah. This needs to happen. Well, you know, I used to also have a, a real different opinion about guaranteed appointments. Um, but I know why we have, I mean, the, the protection that guaranteed appointments offers persons of color, hmm. women. Yeah. I think it's, it's worth the complicatedness yeah. of what you just described, yeah. uh, in my opinion. Um, I mean, it'd be great to say, you know, you're ineffective, you know, clean your office out, hand me your keys. Um, but that doesn't give you a fair, a fair shot, a fair day in court, if you will, even though it's not court. But, um, but I, I, there are still places that will not accept people of color and women. And if it were not for guaranteed appointments. They'd have nowhere to go. they have nowhere to go. I will say, though, too, and I, I, I remember years ago in South Georgia, this city, white male appointed there uh and like a lot of small um southern towns the downtown area all the landed you know folks the owners who own mm-hmm. everything they're in the farms mm-hmm. the people in town are african-american in the south and so the kids come after school they play basketball the church didn't like that they wanted to put locks on the basketball goals although there was no one there during the week <laughs> and so pastor took the locks off played basketball with them invited him to vbs invited him to come you know after school and hang out and they came to vbs they sang on sunday morning and they called a meeting and they said what are you going to do if one of these kids and their family come down the aisle on Sunday morning and join the church. And he said, I'm going to receive them as members. And they called the DS and the bishop. They wanted him out like the next day. And they said, no, he's not going anywhere. So there, there are issues where no, you, you racist, you, you don't, you, you, this, this the body was, of Christ. You know, so it's, it's also when I tell people that there's something about that is you're appointed by the bishop. You're not, you can't be fired, for example, in the middle of the night by the church. And so it, it protects your prophetic voice. Right. Sometimes mm-hmm. there are things That's you right. need to say, and, and it'll really tick people off. Right. And right. they might want you gone tomorrow. Right. But our system protects that. You know, my brother's Southern Baptist. Um, he's, he's been there a long time, so he can, once, once you build the tenure, right. you're right. able to deal with more trust. But if not, you gotta be careful what you say. Right. You know? Yeah. That's right. And it hurts your, last thing I'll ask you, what you've been involved in a lot of these meetings and protocols and uh, worldwide stuff. How do you see the future going forward in the United Methodist Church? How's it going to be navigated? For example, like we've got Africa. The bishops have said that they're going to remain United Methodist, uh, which doesn't make some people happy that are leaving the United Methodist. They assumed right. Right. that Africa, I mean, some in Africa may go, but yeah. um, you're going to have a global church. You're going to have a church that probably needs to be restructured. Right. Because I doubt, as Bishop Miyumbo told us when he was with us, you know, that they're very traditional and they're not mm-hmm. going to change right. that position. But he's very open to some regional redefinition. Right. What are your thoughts, just real quick, about what is the, if you had to draw up and had a crystal ball, what does the United Methodist Church look like, you know, as far as we operate right. organizationally? Well, two things. First of all, you know, there's that legislation, the Christmas Covenant, regionalization. I think makes a lot of sense. Mm. Uh, and what people don't realize is that the the central conference does not, the central conferences, which is Africa, the Philippines, and Europe, they do not have to adhere to everything in our book of discipline. Mm-hmm. Not everything applies to them. Mm. So what if there were some things that we all agreed to, articles, relig- you know, that's the front part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then there were contextual. The back bits were contextual. Were contextual. <laughs> I mean, what what might that look like? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm I'm I don't think the Chris I don't think the Christmas covenant and the regionalization model. I think there's more work to do on that. Mm-hmm. I'm relying on the delegates to do that work yeah. at general conference. But I think that's a that's a good way to start thinking about mm-hmm. this. Is that it can't be one size fits all because if we're going to be United Methodist and be unified, not uniform, then we're going to have to adapt differently to um to what we who we say that we are and how we do our work um that and um no what was i gonna say about the other thing the regionalization oh um back in 2012 
we had the Towers Watson report. Mm-hmm. You remember, remember Tampa, two thousand twelve? Mm-hmm. I get, you know, PTSD every where, time where I go to Tampa. everything was stricken down uh-huh. after it was. So done. the the body approved it, mm-hmm. but the judicial council ruled that it was unconstitutional. So, um, what if? And and in my spare time, I went back and read the Towers Watson report to see is there something? It was a great report. And it was it offered some possibilities for restructuring the church that I think could be helpful. What can what did, have what's happened since the Towers Watson report? Are there pieces of it that still are relevant for us today? Mm. What are, what were the things exactly that the Judicial Council ruled unconstitutional? Can those be addressed now? So I'm, you know, I'm I'm thinking about that. Uh, I also will say that we have had an unhealthy relationship with General Conference. You know, we, we, you know, it didn't happen and we all like, oh my God, what are we going to do now? Nobody was doing anything. And, uh, you know, we've, we've all continued to, to make disciples with or without a General Conference. So how, you know, how is it that, what can we do that does not require General Conference action that is that would help us structure a church for the future, especially given where we are now. So kind of three facets. How's that piece? Go back, look at the Towers Watson report. Are there pieces of that that we can resurrect that make sense today? And then let's look at this regionalization covenant, Christmas covenant model, which actually came from the Philip. The Coven- yeah, Christmas Central covenant came from the Central mm-hmm. Conferences, came from the Philippines. And uh, how can then we start doing some earnest work uh, toward that? Mm-hmm. I don't think the structure that we have currently is sustainable. Mm. No, no. A friend of mine, uh, Jeremy Pridgen in Alabama, West Florida, mm-hmm. he wrote an interesting article, and I'll have to send it to you, but it's about how really the annual conferences have ceded more power and authority to the general conference than really the book of discipline allow, or allows or makes space for. And so that we're the ones that put more focus on general conference that because the annual conference right. is the basic body, body of, of the, the church, church. Mm-hmm. says yeah. that mm-hmm. yeah. in that book. So I think it's interesting to figure all that stuff out. Yeah. So what's one thing I didn't ask you that you'd like for folks in the oh. Texas conference to know about you um. or to I'll say just, to him, uh, I'll just ask for patience mm. uh, in this this transition. Uh, I'm going to have to relearn some things. I'm going to have to unlearn some things that I thought I knew mm-hmm. uh, because this is a different place. Mm. That was one question I forgot to ask. What? What's something in Louisiana in your last eight to ten years? You may not want to answer. If you don't, just say no, and we'll do the sign off. We can always edit this part out if we want to. Dean, you have anything you want to add? Dean, okay, okay. just. All right. um, Where's, where's, where's something where you maybe failed or you misstepped or mm. you didn't do something or didn't turn out that you thought, man, I learned that. So next time I go somewhere, that's a lesson mm. I take with me. Yeah, I, probably early on, I should have paid more attention um, to our African-American churches and clergy. In mm. uh, looking back, uh, I will say that that's something we've worked on it, but I don't know that I um, sat down and truly listened, um, and so I, that's that's a sin. I mean, I'll just admit to that. Yeah. Um, the other is I put together a group about two years ago, after 2019, at a table that had equal number of um, centrists, progressives, and traditionalists. Mm. And it was a great, we started with, and, and what it, how it started was, I, I'm just by nature, I was spending more time with the centrist progressives, that's the leaning, than the traditionalists. So I had a meeting with the traditionalists, mm-hmm. eight of them. And I, I said, you know, I haven't spent enough time with you. And, and I need to hear, I need to mm-hmm. be with you. I need to understand why you are, you know, why you are who you say you are and how you see the church. And after a couple of those meetings, they said, what we need is to invite a centrist progressive to come with us. Mm. So I, I said, you pick who you want. Mm. I mean, I'm not going to get involved in that. You, and so those eight people brought, each of them brought a person. Wow. And they brought a centrist progressive with them. Some Louisiana is a very small conference, doesn't have a lot of influx of people from the outside. So these are people that 
know grew each up other. together, know each other, have been, you know, mm-hmm. youth group together. So they really knew each other. And it, we had some really powerful, powerful conversations. Hmm. So I had this thought that we'd come to annual conference and they'd have this beautiful resolution that, you know, kind of sounded like, you know, we'd sing Kumbaya at the <laughs> yeah. end and, and we'd all, you know, uh, kiss and make up and it'd be all fine. And it didn't quite work out that way. And I regret that it didn't. But what I learned is that that my my outcome, what I thought I wanted, like that beautiful kumbaya resolution, was really not what was important. Mm. The meetings mm. that we had when we sat around the table yeah. and people talked about their own pain, their own experiences, was worth it all. Yeah. But I, you know... I had an idea that this is what, you know, ought to come at the end. Yeah. And it didn't. And, you know, that, but as I look back, I realize that the most valuable thing mm. that happened is mm. those people coming to, just the courage to come to the table. Yeah. Spirit was up to something. And then to talk <laughs> about their, and some of them shared some very personal reasons why they were where they were. And uh, so they at least her i believe they heard one another mm, yeah. uh, did it change an outcome i hope it changed some hearts uh in the process but um you know i i, I was thinking about that um the other day cuz i th- thinking yeah that just didn't work out the way i wanted to and then as i thought more and reflected on the conversations it was more than what i wanted uh, because of the conversations that occurred at that table. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, conversations, a currency of change. And so I just, um, and, and change in the church happens like it's sometimes it's glacial. <laughs> and so I just have to, you know, may not, I may not see it in my lifetime, but you know, I've got six years left to serve and I, I'm, I'm going to do everything in my power to um, move move this church um, forward, even if it feels glacial, yeah. if it feels like, you know, um, we still have a million miles to go. Um, I, I, I want to, six years from now, I want to say, you know, I, I made an impact You here. did your part. I did yeah. my part. Yeah. Um, and I have a good friend that reminds me always, God's middle name is surprise. <laughs> and so I'm prepared for the surprises of the spirit. Amen. Um, yeah. It's okay. I appreciate you coming and doing this. this is you fun. were in town before you got out and it came up and everybody was like, we really need to do something like this so that people in our conference can get to know you. So. That's not just one of those standard, hi, I'm Bishop Cynthia Harvey. Yeah. I'm glad to be coming to yeah. the Texas conference. Yeah. Those are nice too. Yeah. I'm sure you'll do one. And if you do, it'll be really nice. Yeah. Well, and maybe you can, you know, can we make a deal here? Oh, yeah. Maybe after a few months, <clears throat> we talk again. Oh, yeah. So this won't that, be the last time. So that, you know, we can <laughs> And we can get you in person, which is good. We can yeah. communicate, you know, what I'm learning. That'd be you great. Know, what I thought I knew and, you know, I was mm. totally wrong you, about. You know, one of the things that's great about podcasting is you can go back. It's like journaling. Yeah. Like we started this in February 2020 and there's like a like the first or second where I sit here at the table and go, hey, Matt, you heard of this thing called coronavirus? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so good. And like when we went through Har- Harvey, when we went through pandemic, yeah, yeah. it's so, you know. I don't journal, I don't write, I'm not gonna write a book, yeah. but now I can go back and like when I'm old yeah. in the nursing home and I can watch yeah. the podcast. Yeah, that's right. That's There's right. one thing I will say. Yeah. I'm okay being wrong. Mm. It's taken me a long time. Dean Harvey. <laughs> um, my husband has taught me that I don't always have to be right. Yeah, that's a hard one. It's really hard. What's your Enneagram? Uh, I'm, you know, it's, it's, I think I'm a nine. Okay. No, I think I'm an eight, sorry, an eight. I rely on my nine. Um, hmm. which is, that's hard for eights and threes uh, to fail well. And uh, I always feel like I I grew up believing that, you know, you've got to be right. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a justice streak. Yeah, it is that justice streak. Which is good when funnel, I'm an eight, yeah. the wing seven. Yeah. Oh, I'm a, I wing to the nine yeah. just because. I wing for fun. Yeah. That's why I want to go pastor a pub. So that's why we get along because you're an eight. Uh, but, you know, Dean has taught me. Eights are really good when we're healthy, but when we're not healthy, oh, operating Lord, healthy, it's, yeah, it's, not, yeah. it's not good. So, so I don't have to be right. That's good. I, don't have to be I right. do. So um, I'll, I'll offset that. <laughs> maybe that's why you're here. No, you here. don't. <laughs> maybe, that, 
Maybe that's why you're here to disciple John. <laughs> Matt, you got anything else? No, it's, we're just excited that you're you're here. We're I'm just I, I feel like just a wave of the fresh spirit that's Thanks. coming. So. Good yeah, it's a new day. It's a new day to get past, you know, a lot of this stuff that's been going on. I really want us to start looking forward. Yeah, we got you know, some work to do. We're, we're, we're trying to, Let's we're go. trying to, we're trying to tie up that here in the local church and here in the conference. And it's time, it's time to just say, look, everybody's, everybody's gotten to where they need to get. Some people say, yeah. well, the people are not free yet. I'm like, they're working it out in their church, yeah. you know, and not every church is a hundred percent on yeah. this thing. Yeah. Um, they're diverse. So let it, give them some time. I loved what Bishop Sines said in his address. I'm tired of walking in the wilderness. We know where we need to go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I totally agree. Yeah. All right. Well, it's been Thanks. fun. Well, I'm John Appreciate Stevens. It. I'm Matt Russell. I'm Cynthia Fierro Harvey. And this is Pot Have Mercy. Oh,